this is a, this is really a emotional, important week for me. It's a great sense of of gratitude for me to be here. Gratitude to my dear friend, Pastor Kurt. Gratitude for the very fact that it was in Pasadena at a little, little holiness mission. In fact, the pastor's here this morning down on Blake Street back in 1957 when I came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and how I was loved and nurtured and how I've been loved and nurtured in this place and in this city. Pasadena has been wonderful to me. Uh, a boy like me, grew up without a mother, grew up without a father, grew up in semi-slavery in Mississippi, and then was able to come to California, find the Lord Jesus Christ, and then for the last 45 or so almost years, I've been able to be a, a missionary. And I always considered myself a missionary back to my home state of Mississippi from California. And I'm one, I can say that you not only can you trust God, but you can trust God's people. And God's people has been good to us that we raise eight children and God has blessed us. And it's because, and I really wanted to be here, be back home to say to all of my friends, probably for the last time I know for CCDA to be here, to say to all of the people who you helped to, by supporting me and supporting the ministry, you helped to bring CCDA into, into existence. And, I, and I, when I lived here and, and, and when I went away, I, I always felt uh, I could speak about this church with absolute confidence that I had friends here. And that's a good feeling to have. Uh, that you, you feel God has called you to, to a ministry and to a work, and then God's people get behind you and uh, support you in that. And so I have a great sense of gratitude. So I'm here, and I welcome all of you uh, to be here. here. Uh, so I remember that Pastor Kirk was, we was discussing one time. He, when he got here, he said, John, how can we make this church here? reflect the community and the neighborhood. How can we make this church here relevant to the neighborhood and to the community? And of course, I can come back here and, and see that God has blessed it and made that happen. And so I'm, I'm delighted uh, to be here. Now, if you have your Bibles this morning, open them to um, the little book of Philippians. That's going to be our study this week, and I'm going to tell you why we are studying uh, Philippian. We're going to try to, we're going to read the Bible. One of the things that I'm doing, I have two 530 in the morning Bible class back home with, uh, with some people. And, uh, and what we do prim primarily is that we just sort of read the Bible and try to help the Bible to speak to us, that we try to hear what's in the Bible. You, you know, not just all the commentary about the Bible, but to allow the Bible to speak to us. And so this week, we're going to go through the little book of Philippians. And we're going to be listening to God as he speaks to us uh, from this book this morning. Uh, what, so open it there. But my theme for this morning is building on the, our theme that we have. What are you going to do with it? And my thought this morning, the first strip here I want to read, you don't have to turn there. But the first scripture I want to read that's really going to set the basis for what I'm going to be saying the rest of the week and also set the basis for uh, CCDA. And it's found in the little book of James, uh, chapter 1 and verse 22. And let me read this passage, and then we'll get into our teaching uh, here this morning. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. For if any person be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is likened to a person who looks in a mirror and sees his face. For behold, he sees himself, but he goes away, straight away, 
not seeing what kind of person he was. But whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in all of his work. You got it fixed? got to wait a minute here. Okay. Okay, can can okay. What I was setting up here was what CCDA is all about. CCDA is an attempt, I can move this now, can I? Okay, okay. CCDA is an attempt to, to apply the word of God, to live by the word of God, to accept the fact that the Bible, the, the revelation we have here is from God. It is not they that hear the word will be blessed, but they that do the word will be blessed. Because it was really, in my conversion, it was really the word of God that brought it about. I truly believe when the writer to the Hebrews says, for the word of God is living, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, it pierced to the vitin of sun of soul and spirit and joints and mars and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's the way the word of God affected me. When I was able to see that I was a sinner but that God loved me. And so the Bible says then, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so what we as believers, we are stewards of the word of God because it's the word of God that gives us life that we are born again not of corruptible seed but incorruptible seed by the word of God which lives and abides forever and so it becomes our responsibility as the people of God to create an environment where the word of God can be proclaimed but it also has to be lived out in our lives and that we then must be people that embodies the word. I think that's what Paul was trying to get at when he said we have this treasure of God's revelation and glory in these earthen vessels so that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. And so the word of God is just not enough to proclaim it, but there must be a manifestation of the words present embodied in us uh, you know that's a truth that we have almost lost within the church we've almost lost the fact that the church is the continuation of Jesus of Nazareth body here on earth why he his earthly body was resurrected the church now become his body and he lives and he moves in us and so it's not enough just to proclaim it, but that we got to create a present. It's got to be incarnated in our lives. And so that we have to both then proclaim it, and that we also got to live it out in our lives. I guess I could see that so well when I got back to Mississippi uh, 40 years ago. I was in the Bible Belt, but in that Bible Belt, the church if you please, the Southern Baptist Church had embodied racism and had become the stewards of it. And it was just like it was in South Africa. South Africa couldn't get their freedom until the Reformed Church itself was able to see itself because it had been the one, last one, the whole slavery and the apartheid together. That's the way it was in Mississippi. The church was maintaining 
the racism and the bigotry in the state. At the same time, they was talking about the South as being the Bible Belt. They was preaching the Bible with anger. But at the same time, they had become their oppressors within the society. I could see that there. And in that situation, I began to say, we got to live out the Bible. We got to see ourselves as being the continuation of Christ's presence here on earth in this neighborhood, in this community. That's why community development came about. Community development came about because we had to be the people of God in a geographical neighborhood so that people could see what we was doing and I hope from that they would come to know Christ. I think that was the interpretation of what Jesus was saying when he meant, what he meant when he said, let your lights so shine before the humanity that they might see our good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. So CCDA came out of a desire to not only proclaim it, but to proclaim it and also live it out in a geographical situation so that we as a people of God could impact the social, economic, and spiritual life and the well-being of the people in that neighborhood. And that's who we are as a people. We are, here, we are people believe that the highest commandment affirms what Jesus said that you are to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and then love your neighbor as you love yourself, and to have a neighbor. And that our faith must be expressed then in the neighborhood in which we live, in the community. Because we could see very clearly in Mississippi that all the intelligent, young, bright people was getting their education, and they were first leaving the community, going up north. When they stopped going up north, they began to leave the community in which the poor people live. And so the people was left there in that community while they would come back into the community to commute and worship on a Sunday morning. But there was no presence of the people of God in the neighborhood concerned about the well-being of the people the other six days a week. And so people really begin to see those people are just people coming in to get whatever they was able to get, but was not contributing very much to the neighborhood. And that's what it had happened throughout America, that we were leaving the poor behind. And while we had churches in those neighborhoods, of course, the white churches, pretty soon they moved out. But the black people themselves in the 60s and 70s, they too began to move out. They would commute back in there on a Sunday morning but they were unrelated. They had to build, put guards on their parking lot and put fences around their parking lot to keep the people in the neighborhood from stealing the hubcaps off in their cars. And so we say that you've got to create a present in that neighborhood. And so we began to do that in Mendenhall. And then we began to do it around the country. And then 14 years ago, we called together 37 people. And we said, why don't we try to bring all the people together, begin to bring the people from around America who are doing Christian community development. Why don't we bring them together into an association, association of equals, association where we would learn from each other, that we would sharpen each other's skills, and, and that we would be the people of God. And that's what CCDA is all about. Well, what I'm really trying to say this morning, that CCDA is trying to live out the word. And one of the things, the reason I've done this uh, 14 times, I never wanted to be said that we were just a group of right-wing or left-wing liberals or socialists or communists, was only concerned about social development, but wasn't concerned about the Word of God and wasn't concerned about bringing people to Jesus Christ and seeing them bond again into the family of God, I said, we're going to set up this conference, and the centerpiece is going to be the Bible, the Word of God, and that we were going to be struggling together trying to understand the Word of God and then apply this Word of God in our lives and go back to the community and, and live it out in the community. So that's the idea. Now let's go to our teaching this morning, uh, the little book of Philippians. And let me tell you why I'm doing the little book of Philippians. Because you, every year when I finish 
the convention, I began to think and listen to the people. And I began to say, you know, what I'm going to teach next year. So I give a long study to what I'm going to teach. And I try to then to reflect upon what's going on in the world, what's going on in my community, what is the greatest need we have. And then I try to select the Bible, book in the Bible, that better reflects that and then teach that. And that's the way I teach in a way. I go to the scripture with my burden. And then I go to the scripture, and then I find the scriptures, I read the scripture. As that scripture sort of reflects to me that burden and helps to lift my burden, then I then try to put that into a form that I can communicate it to the people around me so that we together can share this burden together. And so it always starts. Uh, with the burden and I'm thought with the idea that the Bible is the Word of God and that it can be applied to our life situation in society. And so the little book of Philippians, I was looking at it and I was thinking about what is the, at least what is I see right now as one of the greatest problems we face in our society where I'm living and it's the prison. The prison. We almost have now in America, right near a, about 2,600,000 people in prison. And more than 50% of those are black young folks. In my state of Mississippi, we have 14,000 black men in prison we have only 7,000 in college. So we got twice the amount of young men in prison than we have in college, and it costs twice the amount to keep them in prison than we could send them to our colleges in Mississippi. That's a burden. That's where the young, and it's very difficult now for a more upright young black woman in my neighborhood to find a man to marry because so, much, so many of them is in prison, so many of them is dope. In Mississippi, in our prison system altogether, we have 22,000 people in prison. We have 40,000 is involved in the probation system under control of the government in our society. And as I say, a great percentage of those, a great percentage of those are young black people. So the, the whole generation, almost a whole generation of black folks who ought to be leading the community, who ought to be getting married and taking care of their children, and that's becoming in our community is not something that the black boy is looking forward to, is getting married. Of course, they're looking forward to uh, giving birth uh, to, uh, to children. So in my neighborhood where I come from, 84%, 85% of the children are being raised without a man in the home. And so we got to go to the prison. We got to go to the prison. We got to do something about it. And so this book came out of my going to the prison. And the sheriff came to me in Mississippi. We have in our county in Mississippi, we're the largest county, and in our jail, we had over 1,000 people in, in that jail, in our prison there. And he came to me and asked me, he said, uh, John, he said, these people go out of prison, and less than two years, 80% of them is coming back. They call that recidivism or something like that. And he, and he said, I want you to come in. And he said, we have all of these people coming in here practicing their sermons on the people, uh, but they, are not, they don't have very much content. And not only that, he says, that when uh, these people get out, the problem is they have no one to receive them when they get out and to disciple them and to nurture them. He said, would you come into the prison and would you work with me first with my guards, 
I'm going to put the guards, all of the Christian guards, we're going to call them together, and I'm going to let them know that you are the person who's going to work with us in trying to come up with a, a reform system in the Bible. This sheriff happened to be a, a Christian. And, and so we got going on that program, and it is going in Mississippi. And it's, uh, we are getting churches. Uh, of course, that's happening within CCDA. Uh, because at Lundale, we have the Hope House there. And in the Hope House there, we have young men who are coming out of prison. And we are integrating those young men back into, into the society. And they are getting married to our young people in that community and becoming fathers in those neighborhoods. So this came out of my burden and my concern for prison. Well, this letter here is what you would call one of Paul's uh, prison epistle. He wrote this letter from prison. And so we're going to be, that's one of the reasons that I, I, I selected uh, this book. I also was selecting it because I knew I would be coming back to, to Pasadena and I knew I would be at Lake Avenue Church. And I said that uh, this was, for Paul's perspective, this little book of Philippians was a thank you letter to his favorite church and his favorite support church that supported him as he went out as a missionary. And this letter itself is a thank you letter. And so I said, well, I'm going to be back there, and I want to thank the people at Lake and all of my friends. It's going to be my chance to do it for all of their support for us. And so this, I went to this little book because it fitted the mood uh, that I'm in, and I think it's going to say some of the things that I really want to say both to you about prison and about my burden, but also the joy that I have. And of course, this is the theme of this book. The theme of this book here is, and, and joy ought to come out of gratitude. Gratitude. Uh, that's why I go so much against this prosperity naming and claiming Christianity. Because it's serving God for what God can give you. You don't serve God for what you can get. You serve God for what he's already done for you at the cross. I love that old hymn that says, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed me white as snow. We don't serve God to get. This so-called seed salvation, I'm planting a seed in order that I may get back from God, is not a biblical thought. The seed thought there is that more people might come into the kingdom and that the kingdom of God might grow, not that I might be more prosperous. God don't promise us that kind of prosperity. What he promises more, that he will bless us out of suffering and pain. And we're going to see that in this letter. And that we're going to see that Paul's joy is going to come out of his obedience to God. It's going to be like Jesus said, that, uh, that he counted the joy for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. And Paul and the disciples said they counted the joy to suffer shame for his name. And so the joy now is just not coming out of consumer blessing. The joy here is coming out of the fact that he is carrying the word of God for us and people are coming into the kingdom. And that's the joy, not just joy out of, uh, out of prosperity. And, and so this, this letter... Is, is about that. I guess that's enough uh, about the letter. I guess what we need to do now is get into it and, uh, and, and read it and begin to teach it. So let's begin then in verse, uh, in verse 1 of our letter here. Uh, it says, uh, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ. Um, Paul uh, let's say a word about Paul just for the new convert. Uh, you know Paul's experience. He had this dramatic experience on the Damascus Road. And it's something that he's writing to the church here because in his early days, what he wanted to do was to stamp out the church. And it, you remember, he went to the high priest in Jerusalem 
uh, he had heard about these Christians was infiltrating the synagogues in Damascus. And so he got a letter from the high priest to go there. And if he found those people, he was going to bound them and he's going to bring them back to Jerusalem. And he was going to do them in Jerusalem like they had just done Stephen. Because when they stoned Stephen, the apostle Paul went mad. And he began this persecution, trying to get rid of him. So on his way to Damascus uh, to kill the Christian, uh, this is when he met Christ. And this is when he really coined the word, the grace of God. Here was this murder on his way to commit other murders. And the murders he wanted to commit was these people on the way. And as he got near Damascus, uh, he met Christ in all of his love and all of his grace. He was struck to the ground and he heard a voice. And this voice could have sounded something like this. Saw, saw, I love you. I love you. Why you don't love me? Why is it so hard? for you to go on fighting against me. So I could say, who are thou, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus. I'm Jesus who love you. Paul is going to express this in his word, in this, in this epistle. On that road to Damascus, Paul was grabbed by Jesus Christ. And he put him in his arms of love. He embraced him. And he squeezed him in his arm. And the Apostle Paul is going to say that as we go through this. He's going to say that, that, that if I could lay hold of Christ the way he laid hold of me on that Damascus road. And the Apostle Paul was always trying to experience that embracement again. That I may know him. That I reach out after that I may apprehend him, him the way he apprehended me on that Damascus road. And so he was loved. He was embraced. He was apprehended. He was captured. He was captured by Christ's love. Now, you know that's what the gospel is. I've been having a good time talking to my people from Egypt and others. And we've been talking about Islam. And one of the things they said that... Uh, Within the Quran language, they tell me this. I don't know anything about that. You know, I don't even speak English. I speak Ebony. Uh, uh, so you know I don't know anything about uh, the, the Quran language and all of that. But I only know what they tell me. They, they say that there is no uh, language in the Quran that expresses love. Love. That's what the gospel is about. That's the message we have from heaven. That is the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Greater love than no one than this, the one who laid down his life for his friend. And so this apostle was embraced on that road. And then he asked the question that we are asking. You know, now he'd been embraced, it could have been something like this. Uh, Paul, what are you going to do about it? He echoed it, says, Lord, what would you have me to do? Now, he understood the relationship of being converted and the relationship of doing good works. Unfortunately, we have separated that. The apostle Paul, when he was embraced on that road, he recognized that God embraced him for a purpose. Because he's the one who expresses it. When Paul says to the Ephesians, he says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that faith is not of yourself. It is the gift of God. It's not of our own effort and works, lest anyone should boast. But we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. We, evangelical Christians, have separated faith from works. That's what James tries to say to us. Because Christ saved us. 
He came into this world to recruit a labor force, people that was going to do his will. Jesus came into his wor world as the grace of God, that he was full of grace and truth, and that he was there, lo I come, as it is written in the volume of the book, to do thy will, O Lord. Not my will, but thy will be done. In the Christian church today, people have the option. They said it to me all the time, and I say, why don't you talk to your friend about Jesus? They said, that ain't my calling. They'll say to me, that's not my gift. We have come up with a Christianity of disobedience, and that we have learned words that we can use that removes all responsibility from us of doing the work of God. God has no other hand here on earth but your hand and my hand. We are the body of Jesus Christ. And so we have separated it. We have separated. Paul understood that. He heard the call. What do you call me to do then, Lord? He said, I've called you to send you far away to the Gentiles, the very people that you are trying to kill, you are trying to destroy, the very influence that you are trying to remove from Judaism. I'm sending you to these people to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God, and he's going to say, I was not disobedient to that heavenly vision. So God calls us. I'm listening, I'm listening to this religion today. I'm listening to all this religious talk today. And, and they're all talking about God. And they're all talking about God's blessing. And they're all seeking a blessing. It's our task to be obedient, to do the will of God. He came not to do his own will, but the will of the Father. And the Bible said, as he was, so are we in the world. And we are left here. So Paul un 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 understood that. And so Paul, in his vision and his attempt to carry the gospel to the world, that was his desire. He understood the task. And you know, really, that's our task too. That's our task too. While we are here as community and neighborhood developers, we can't lose the vision for the whole world. We're supposed to be recruiting people and, and empowering them and to releasing their creativity so that they can share the gospel to them in the world. That's our task. That's our main task before us. Uh, what we're going to do on Friday at noon, we're going to call together uh, a group of uh, people, Africans that are here, and all people who are concerned about the plight of Africa, all people who are concerned about the aid crisis in Africa, all people who are concerned about these billions of children is going to have to be raised without fathers and without mothers because they're dying of, they're dying of aid. We're going to call together a meeting here. Uh, first of all, we want the Africans here to come together. But well, we want all of you who are concerned about it, Friday at noon, and we're going to find a bill and we'll announce it, and we're going to come together. But first of all, we're going to give the responsibility back to the Africans. Uh, uh, you know, it's easy to get an African out of Africa and get him here in the United States and get him a PhD. The problem is, how do we get him back to the village? How do we get him back to the village? And so we believe that the people with the problem has got to first take responsibility for it. That's what community development is about. And then we then, as a collective body, got to stand alone beside of them and to help them. That's what have happened in Egypt. That's why we have CTD in Egypt. An Egypt priest from the Coptic church came to visit with us, and we shared with him, and Gardner went over and spent time with him. Then he went back there, and he's created CCDA in Egypt. We want to see that happen all around the country, all around the country. And then we come along beside and support. Our village, is, our village and our church is the equipping and staging area to carry the gospel to the end of the world. Our local church is not the end. It's the means to the end. And the end, you know, Jesus said, the end will come when this gospel of the kingdom is preached into all the world for a witness, 
That's the task before us in society. But we got to create another mode. We're not going out to colonize the people. We're not going, our old gospel went out and participated in colonization. We're not going out colonizing the people. We believe the people out there is creating an image of God. They have dignity. If we can give them the tools or we can come along beside of them and give them the support, the education, and all the things that they need, that people can solve their own problems. That's what makes CCDA a little bit different from all other organizations. That's why you don't hear it as popular as others. Oh, we are not going out there and finding you in poverty and then a person like me stand up and exploit your poverty and tell you that I'm going to do this for you. We go into the community and find people and come along beside them and tell them that they have the first responsibility. Now, how can we join with them to do their development within the community? We use a little old Chinese poem as our method of CCDA. It says... Go to the people, live among them, love them, plan with them, learn from them, start with what they know, build on what they have. So when the best leaders like us leave the community, the people need to say, we've done it ourselves. That's what CCD is about. CCD is about not patronizing people, but getting along beside of them and affirming their dignity and releasing their creativity so that they can take responsibility. And we're finding that out in the STEP programs. We're finding that out. We're finding that out in Alcohol Anonymous. We're finding that out in uh, Drug Anonymous. Uh, as long as people can play the victim role, and as long as it's somebody else's fault, their problem, they won't solve it. It's only when they take responsibility for it themselves and then recognize the fact they need outside help, they need all the help they can get, then they begin the healing and the development. That's the difference between CCDA. That's the difference, and there's a whole lot of difference. It says that we believe in inherited dignity of the poor. Uh, we believe that if we stand beside of them, bring them the good news of the gospel, nurture them and disciple them, they can take responsibility for their lives and take responsibility for their own neighborhood and their own community as we come along beside and, and develop it. Uh, we did that in, here in Pasadena. In Pasadena. We did that with Arambe. Uh, we went up there and moved into the community. And Virma and I stayed up there for 13 years. And then we have moved on. Now it's left up to the people there in the neighborhood. It's left up to them. To do it and sometimes they call me now like I'm supposed to come and fix the problem I'm not here to fix the problem you got to fix it the person with the problem you know more about it than I do you in the best possible position to solve the problem within the neighbor in the community that's to us Christian community development okay Paul I didn't get but one word here let's go and let's get a, we, we only got that we only got to Paul we only got to Paul. We didn't even get to Timothy, did we? <laughs> Paul and Timothy. Well, Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, and to all the saints which are at Philippi, with all the bishop and de deacon, he says, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he, verse 3 says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Uh, Paul remember that it was him that went to Philippi and Macedonia. He got that vision and that call, and he started that church in jail. When the jailer, you remember, was converted there, and the church began uh, in Philippi. And then as he went around the rest of the world preaching the gospel, this church became his support church. And he carried that church and all the other churches, he said, on his heart all the time, on his heart. But especially he carried this church of Philippi because this church of Philippi that was born in the midst of pain and suffering, uh, it was this church that understood pain and suffering. And they was always along with the apostle Paul, supporting him. And so he's writing this letter and he says, I am so grateful. 
I am so grateful. He said, every time I think about you, I get a sense of, of joy in my heart. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always and ever prayer of mine, he says, I pray for you all. He said, I'm making requests with joy. I'm making requests with joy about you. And the joy is coming out of the fact that you have had fellowship and partnership with me in this gospel from the first day even unto now. Because that right away when that jailer, you remember, cried out from that jail, said, what must I do to be saved? Right away, he took Paul and Silent and those people and he began to wash their wounds and clean them up. And so he knew the relationship between obedience to Christ and meeting human needs that was a part of his conversion experience there. And so Paul says that, that you have had fellowship. And everywhere he would go, when he had a need and they would find out about it, they would send it. And even in this letter here, he's writing it back. And he's going to send the letter probably back by Ephroditus who had brought that letter to him, but also had brought some resources to help him to meet his needs in the community. And he'll talk about that later on in, 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 in the epistle. And so the Apostle Paul thought about this church with great sense of, of gratitude and joy. Look what he says here. For your fellowship in the gospel, from the first day, he said, even unto right now. And that fellowship here is they're sharing their life together. Yes, they're enjoying being together. They're enjoying saying together. But Paul is talking about here that they are fellowshipping around his needs in the world, that they are supporting him in his pain and his, in, in, his, in his work. And so he says from the first day down. Next, then it says, verse 6, be in confidence of this very thing, that he which begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. And so he's telling them to press on, that God is with them, that he will not leave them, not forsake them. Now he said in verse 7, even as it is meet for me to think that of you, because I have you in my heart, in so much both in my being in jail and also in defense and confirmation of the gospel as, as I prepare of the gospel. You all are partakers of, of my grace. Paul saw his being in prison as a means of fathering the gospel. And you know, this is important. Uh, I really, and we'll get to that tomorrow when I say, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. You know, we as Christians should not look at our problems as something that holds us back, we should look at our problems as problems to be solved and to try to find out what am I learning from this situation. The Apostle Paul saw his prison experience and his suffering as for the gospel. He's going to say, I'm in prison here, but while I'm in prison here, the Roman guards and all of these people is going to hear the gospel because I'm here in prison. And so he looked at it in my own life. You know, I really believe that the God Bible called us to be reconciled. I, I don't believe there is no such thing as a white church, black church, and all that kind of stuff. I think it's unfortunate that we talk like that. I, I'm unfortunate we break the church up along racial lines. I think that was to be a part of God's glory. That in this body there would be Jews and Gentiles, bond and free, black and whites together, loving Jesus Christ. That would be a witness to the world. I think he meant it that way in the society. And I think I sort of always believed that. But that didn't really become a deep experience. And I had been so blessed because I had all of these white friends and black friends who supported me. Uh, but it really didn't get to me until 1970 when 23 of us were locked in the Brandon jail, and there we was almost beaten to death. I was almost beaten to death. I, I saw the hopelessness. I can identify 
a little bit with the suicide bombers. You take a person and remove all the future away and all the hope. And if you are born in a refugee camp and if you are surrounded with all of this power and is brutalized all the time, your dignity cries out for an expression. That night in that Brendan jail, if I could have tied a bomb around myself and blew myself up when those highway patrol would beat me, I would have done that. It would have been an expression that I have dignity, but I couldn't do it. So I have a little sympathy. I have a little understanding of hopeless people in the world. And it, we, it's the church's responsibility to hold forth hope in the world to hold forth hope in the world and that we are to be the hope of people in the world and society. I like that little clip last night that Gordy showed, that the woman was saying to him, hang on, don't lose hope because when you lose hope, you've lost it all. You've lost it all uh, in, in, in the world. And so he talks about his learning experience while he's uh, in prison. Then verse 8 says, for he says, i for God is my record, how greatly I long to see you in all the bonds of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in judgment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Jesus Christ. You know, one of the things I've been watching is how Farrakhan, with his poison, Islamic stuff and the influence he are having among black ministers that he have taken some real poison and mixed that poison up and that he's drawing those people in. He was in Mississippi last week dedicating a church, Farrakhan, and he's doing that because these people don't understand. He quotes about Jesus. He says some things about Jesus. And what we have is people have such a shattered understanding of the Bible. And Paul is saying to these people here, he wants them to have an understanding that as they serve Christ, they got to serve Christ with a sense of excellence. That's what Paul meant when he said that we are to study, to show ourselves approved unto God. Workmen that need not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. And so one of the, we're talking about what can we do in terms of confronting Islam, especially as it coming into the urban community. The thing that we really got to do is strengthen the teaching of the word of God. We got to get, let people know where their hope lies. We got to teach them the word of God so they can stand up against all of the pressure that's coming. And so Farrakhan is fooling them because they're not anchored deeply in the word of God. And so he says here, uh, as I bring this to a close this morning, he said, he said, being filled with the fruit of righteousness. He's pointing for them, and I'm going to close with that this morning, that his idea that we as believers, we need to be filled with the fruit of righteousness. Fruit of righteousness. What is the fruit of righteousness? I think if we were filled with the fruit of righteousness, we could resist the falseness in this world. We would not be deceived, not be deceived. And so what is the fruit of righteousness? The fruit of righteousness is, is love, love. The fruit of righteousness is peace, inward peace. The fruit of righteousness is patient, and we call it long-suffering. The fruit of righteousness is being kind, gentle. The fruit of righteousness is being good, good, trying to be good, want to be good. You know, deep down in my heart, I really want to be a good person. I really want to be a good person. And that's a part of the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit, and, and it says here, faith. 
that you got to have faith. You got to live by faith. Uh, he called it meekness and temperance. Now, the fruit of the Spirit is not you doing one of these, but that you're holding them all together. And this is the way that we should live. And so Paul is telling us here how we should live. We should go out and that we should be examples. And so we people in CD, CCDA, yes, we want to be people who understands the word of God. We want to be people who possesses the fruit of the spirit. And then we're going to be the people out there who are going to be rescuing the perishing, caring for the dying, snatching them in pity from sin in the grave. And I was moved even this morning that I hear it young folks who went down last night after seeing that film. And I know some of those young folk will never be the same. Because when they thought of L.A., they thought of Hollywood. They think, but who do you think is down there doing what it needs to be done down there is we the Christians. It is the Christians that are doing it. And that's going to be our other confrontation to Islam. We're going to be there as God's people, along beside of the people that are suffering and is hurting. Let's pray. My time is gone. Before we pray and as we pray, let's remember Friday at noon, I gather. That's very important to me. Uh, Pastor Gus Romo from Canaan Baptist Church in Philadelphia, one of the largest churches in the city, is going to be there with us. God has burdened him for Africa. And we want to come around him. We want to see what we can do to help him as he's working with the indigenous people in Africa. And I want to see CCDA people join with us making an expression 